Welcome back to Profi Plays. I'm Profi, and today we're going to be continuing in the um, Tower of Fulsa with the adventurers of Rose Lake, those that remain. Um, so uh, a couple sessions ago, we had the, the, the big battle. Uh, it's Beds and Bandits was the name of that episode. Uh, where half of our party, including both of our warriors and both of our um, wizards, killed off. And so uh, this time we are going to be continuing in our uh, searching uh, because what happened last time, uh, those remaining party, both of our thieves, uh, two of our clerics, and our halfling, uh, along with their friend they picked up, the wizard Bipeld, who was not involved in combat, uh, were searching more of that particular floor of the tower. Uh, they found well, a laboratory which just so happened to have the exact book that our party was looking for, and also we happened to run across uh, Vilbo the halfling's mentor of sorts, um, a uh, another halfling by the name of Tars, uh, rather unexpectedly, happened to be in that room looking for the same thing because he was also working for Reverend Caliph. Now, so we thought it might be time just to leave, uh, except we were reminded by the wizard Bipel that part of the deal right, was that they would help him find something of monetary value. That's really what he's, he's here for. He wants something that is of significant monetary value, whatever that happens to be, whether it be a chest of gold coins or gemstones or something, right? So, something that is monetarily valuable. That's what he's looking for. So we are continuing then, right? On up to the fourth floor. Now I would remind you in the previous episode, uh, we did hear footsteps up there, right? So there very well might be somebody that we're going to run into up there. There very well could be more bandits. Uh, if so, it's not going to be as many bandits as we did previously because I don't want to lose the rest of my party. Uh, there's yeah, there's uh, a YouTube channel. I, I forget the name of the person that does it. Uh, but uh, Parts Per Million is the name of his company. Publishing, he, he makes lots of kind of short um, solo supplements for a number of different systems. Uh, I've looked at a, a couple of his uh, things before, but he does solo role playing tips and solo RPG tips on his YouTube channel. And one of them was to to start easy, right? So, and that is that when you have your character, your party first come across an enemy, and you're not quite sure right, how powerful your party is yet. Give them what you know is going to be an easy encounter. I clearly did not do that. I think probably I was affected by the fact that when I you know, sent our level zero characters in to what I thought was going to be a funnel, I lost very few of them, right? So I think that uh, I found out that the battles are unpredictable. Right? In any case, right? So I think we do need to uh, continue then, uh, as we have been, on into the fourth floor, right? So we are going up the steps, the fourth floor at this point. All right, so uh, pulling out then, my uh, one page generator includes the dungeon crawler. All right, so we go up the stairs and then I need to roll a series of four D6s. So the first D6 is telling me uh, what type of location is this? So number three, it's a living area or meeting place. All right, so this could be something like a dining room or perhaps another bedroom. We don't know how many people there are living here. Okay, uh, then roll again for the encounter. Uh, six. Six would be another unique NPC or adversary. That is how we found the wizard bipeld and also how we found cars. Now, notice I have so far we've done unique NPCs, but they're not, they've not been adversarial at all. They've, in fact, been somewhat friendly. All right, so a unique NPC or adversary. Uh, then object number five, it's something valuable. Okay, Bipeld's going to be happy. And then finally, exits. This is a dead end. Okay, so that tells us this is the top floor. And as we go up to the top floor, and there is a, a rather large area here. Okay, so 
we find then a unique NPC or adversary. So here's the question that I'd like to ask. Uh, I heard footsteps before, so that makes me think it's probably not a monster, it's probably a person, right? So is it a person? One would be no. So it would be in fact a monster of some kind. So then the question is what kind of monster it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull out here. Okay, so they need a monster that would have uh, footsteps, right? So that naturally is going to rule out some things. Um, so what would make sense to have here, given that one, it's a mentalist uh, that had this space before. I mean, we could do some type of demon, I suppose. That would be a possibility. Um, although I feel like that would just be asking to die. So I don't think I'm going to do that. All right. <laughs> um, no, I don't think it's going to be a dragon. It really doesn't make sense for it to be a dragon. Elemental, oh, maybe. A, a gargoyle might be interesting. Hmm. A gargoyle is, is too hit dice. That's not, that's not too bad. All right. So let's see. So I'm just going to roll to see, like, is it, in fact, a gargoyle? It is not. Okay. Never mind. Um, it kind of seems unlikely. I don't see any reason why there would be a ghoul there. Um, no, no, not a, not a knoll. A goblin, yeah, possibly, maybe. Except that I don't think I don't think there'd be any reason for bandits to be here with a goblin, right? So that, that doesn't really make much sense to me. Um. Uh, mm. Oh, this is kind of a fun idea. So could it be a hollow man? Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and try that. This this could be an interesting one. One as a two hit die creature. Okay, four. That's a yes. I'm just rolling this as fifty fifty. So it's gonna be a hollow one. So here's what the the book says about hollow one. So the hollow one is a self animated marionette. The strange tentacled mass at its nucleus is the puppeteer, directing the actions of the empty man-like shell around it. A hollow one first appears as a tall, gaunt humanoid wearing dark robes. It can cast spells as a level 4 wizard and is typically encountered in some ancient shrine. While the humanoid is... Uh, when the humanoid is slain, its skin splits at the seams, and the slithering tentacled hollow spawn bursts forth, lashing about with its pseudopods. Only when the man-like shell operates in concert with its strange core can the combined creature cast spells. The spawn alone is nearly mindless. Hollow ones are typically encountered in small sects, uh, differentiated by their robe colors, red, green, green. Black and white, each order practices a different type of magic. All prefer to be left alone to worship their terrible gods and study unnameable secrets. All right. So, all right, I guess we're, we're going we're gonna to try this. Okay. So this is only going to be one creature that we're facing. So that being the case, I think it would make sense right, for us to um I'm gonna pull out my pen. I'm gonna do this one theater of the mind instead of gridded. Because right, we just have one monster that we are facing. So two hit dice. Uh for those that are not interested in watching this combat in case it runs long, uh I'm just going to end this episode after the combat is over, and then I can summarize what happened in the next episode. So feel free to skip if you wish. So, although you can always just skip, I don't know why I feel a need to like give permission, right? To you to watch what you want to watch. Okay, so it's, it's seven uh, hit points. So I've got seven hit points here for the thing. Hit points seven. Got it. Now apparently, it can cast uh, spells as a level four wizard. Or, so I need to pull out the level four wizard stats just to remind myself how that works uh, a level four wizard here we go has access to uh, up to uh the second spell level all right 
So I might just like jot down spells they're going to try, and I might just kind of randomly roll to see what spells they're going to do. All right. So that may be how we handle that. So this is a hollow one. Currently in man form. All right. So the question is, I mean, is it going to immediately attack us? Because it doesn't necessarily have to. In fact, it's a lawful alignment, which that in itself is kind of interesting. All right. So I think we need to figure out what its attitude is, because it's not necessarily going to be something that would necessarily attack us. Now, I am also interested in what the valuable thing is here, but I think we're going to deal with that later. So, thinking about what my party's goals are, we are not particularly interested in slaying this thing necessarily. Rather, it's just that Bipeld wants to have something of monetary value and get out. So, let's find out what this thing of monetary value is that we have. Yeah, so, it's kind of... I'll fling my cards up here. So we're looking for what kind of thing this is. Right. So what kind of thing is it? So this would be a detail focus king. So it's something dignified and mystical. So something dignified and mystical. So I think a gem makes sense, but it would be a gem that has some kind of mystical um, connotation to it. I like the idea of a giant sapphire or something like that, right? So, it, so I'm, I'm going to say that's it. So, so there is, in fact, right, in this space, right, uh, which does appear to be some kind of meeting space, I would say, right? So there are, like, you know, benches set up here. Um, probably this is where, like, the various followers would have met, potentially. So I'm actually imagining it kind of set up almost like a, almost like a, like a temple, right? So we have, this is also at the top of the tower as well. So we have a number of benches set up. We have, like, an altar set up where, you know, uh, various magical rites and whatever can be done, right? Rituals and the like. Right? Uh, and there also... I think actually on a stand yeah, on that altar would be this giant sapphire. So really our goal as a party is to get in, distract the hollow one long enough that we can grab this magical sapphire and get out. Now I'm I'm inclined to think this magical sapphire is not in, does not in fact in itself have any power. It's simply a very large sapphire that, that is used as kind of a focus uh, that wizards then would focus on it. All right, so that's what I'm imagining. So let's work things that way. All right, so first thing first. Uh, so we come upstairs. Now, did we sneak upstairs? I didn't, I didn't think do that. So I'm going to say no, we didn't, which means that then we need to roll for initiative. Now, on my side, my top initiative is a plus two. Meanwhile, the hollow one has an initiative of plus zero. So on our side, at a plus two, I've got, oh, come, three. Uh, and then the hollow one has, looks like that's a seven. Eight. All right. So it gets stacked first. All right. So I guess it's not clear to me whether it's going to immediately want to attack us or not. Uh, and it's really just kind of interested in studying magic at this point. So I don't know that it's going to be immediately hostile. Uh, so let me just roll. I'm just going to roll the die here and say, is it hostile? Jason spots is yes or no, and red would be modification. Right, so yes, it is hostile. And, right, so it is particularly hostile. All right, so it is going to attack first thing. Now, it doesn't have any particular reason to attack anyone in particular, which means then I'm going to follow the advice that um, the book suggests, and that is attack whoever has low luck, which means, sorry, Phineas, uh, your luck is currently at a level of three. You're under attack, right? It's so, how, is, okay, okay, let's pull out the spell list. So it's going to be a level one or two spell that this wizard is going to do. It's a total of seven spells available. Uh, 
Vine fine with <laughs> the spell list is in here somewhere. There we are. So the first question is, is it going to be a level one or level two spell? So odds it's level one. Okay, so it's level one. And then we have a total of 26. I'm going to roll as a d30. Right, so let me roll a d30, you roll a d6 as a d3, and then you roll a d10, right? And then, well, it's what's going on. So this would effectively be a three because you divide by th uh, three and then round, divide by two and then round up. So this would be three. Uh, that indicates from the 20s, so 21. Okay, so number 21, rope work, that's 153. Let's see what rope work does. Because I have not done anything close to memorizing. Summons a rope from nowhere, commands it to do their bidding. The rope can be used to entangle foes, climb walls, cross ravines, etc. All right. Well, this sounds like a good thing to do. So let's go ahead and try to tie up Phineas with that rope. All right. So, and I'm also going to roll for manifestation as well. So this is at a plus six, I believe it is. Yes. Yes, yeah, so it's a total of 16. Manifestation is two. So, the rope, the rope drops down from above. So it's like it, it drops down from the ceiling is what it looks like. And then 16, what that does, the catcher summons a rope as above. Uh, so it's 100, uh, it's up to 100 feet in length. It just comes from nowhere. It remains in existence for one turn. So this would be tying up Phineas for a short period of time. Uh, using an existing rope or the summoned one, they can command the rope to rearrange itself into any shape. This can be a symbol, such as an arrow or square, writing numbers or anything else. The rope takes... 1d4 rounds to arrange itself depending on the complexity of the of the request so that's interesting so we, i just wanted to like wrap around phineas which how long is that going to take apparently four turns to wrap itself around phineas which means then i'm just I and mean, if the rope it says remains in existence for one turn that's not very long Right, so I guess we're we're lucky that he's going to be tied up for about four rounds then. All right. So sorry, Phineas, uh, you are tied up for the next four rounds. So I'm just going to take his character sheet, put it off to the side, and I'm going to put a, a die on it with a number four. There we go. Uh, meanwhile, what we really want to do is sneak in and collect that. Um, that giant sapphire. So I think that uh, Marv is going to try to do that. Because he's our other thief. Uh, you know, so stealing something. So he's going to try to sneak silently. Or is he going to hide in the shadows? Uh, no, I think sneaking silently makes sense. And this would add agility modifier of plus one. All right. So total of plus two. Let's see. I'm going to say that right now there are enough of us here that this uh, hollow one is going to be somewhat distracted. Uh, but still, uh, six is probably not enough. Right, so he does not manage to evade uh, the attentions of this Hollow One. Instead, the Hollow One looks right at him, and now he has his attention. All right, uh, meanwhile, we also have our Halfling and our two clerics doing things. Uh, what is our halfling going to do? I, halflings like to attack. So let's say that he's just going to throw his javelin at him. I mean, we're reasonably close. So let's try. Uh, it is in a sea of 12. And that is definitely not going to do it. All right. And so halfling misses. Our clerics, I think, are also going to come in with you know, swinging clubs, sticks, staves, and the like. And so, yeah, how much go ahead and do that? Again, looking for a 12. This is an, this, we don't actually have a modifier on this. So, 9 would be a miss for Helmut. And then Igor, who is in bad shape, actually, and is still taking a minus 4 on his rolls. It's a, it's a minus 5. Why not? Why not? We haven't gotten the thing yet. So, hey, maybe it's going to work. No, no, that was terrible. All right. So we all miss. Uh, so then it comes back around right to our friend, the, the hollow one, who is going to do something else. So let's see, what kind of spell can we cast now? 
Okay, so we have a rope that is tied around one of the characters. I'm going to move one of my... Um, actually, you know, I'm going to take this card and use it as a bug All right. So, again, first or second level spell. And odd says first level. And which spell is it? Okay. So, again, it's, it's a three. So, this would count as a 28. So, 28. Oh, that's actually too high. So, roll it again. All right. That'd be it. Two, so, this would be in the teens. So it'd be 15. Spell number 15 is to invoke patron. Oh, dear. All right. Uh, invoking patron, that would be... They have some kind of uh, demon patron that they are trying to invoke. Uh, okay. Well, what do we know about invoking patron? Onward cast this. Okay. We must have a patron bond. So we actually know who, what two more of the spells are. So let's go ahead. I'm going to write this down. So they have, what is it, rope craft or something like that. Uh, they must have a patron bond. And then invoke patron. All right. And what does invoking a patron do? Okay, invokes the name of this requires at least one point of spell burn. Oh, so he's using spell burn then. Breaking that out. All right, so what spell burn does. It's so a spell burn, if I can find the rules for it. Uh, the idea is fairly straightforward in that you take some form of damage. Right. So Right, so the way it works. Right, so for each ability point you spend, you add plus one to your spell check. Right, so here we go. So let's go ahead and see what he's going to do. There's a d24 roll. So we'll just roll something else along with a 12. Right, so it's going to be number 11. All right, you must pull out a fingernail and it with hand sense. All right, well, I mean, that feels like that's going to, Take some time. Uh, and he's certainly in pain as a result of that. All right, so he's invoking the patron uh, this way. Okay, and let's see what the result of this is. 17, oh, that's pretty good. All right. All right, so. All right, so he's, you know, in invoking this patron to do something. Right. So what exactly is the patron going to do? I don't know. I, mean, I, I feel like this is going to take a little while to actually pass. Um, but, you know, yeah, let's go ahead and let it, let it go, I suppose. Right. So, so we see this thing rip out a fingernail. Right. And quickly, like, burn it. I, I guess there must be, like, Flame somewhere nearby. Uh, toss this into the fire. Say some words. The question is, what is the patron going to be doing? So there is also a set of patron spells. Right? So I think it makes sense one of those is going to get uh, invoked. So there are eight patrons here. So I'm just going to roll a d8 to figure out which patron we're dealing with. Uh, it's number four. Uh, patron number four is the king of Elfland. So 340. Who give us some idea? Oh, right here. Invoke patron check. So here's what happens. The caster's weapons are endowed with the slumbering magic of Elfland for the next 1d5 plus caster level rounds. Uh, targets struck by the caster's weapons must succeed on a DC 10 plus, uh, plus caster level will save or succumb to magical sleep. Oh, that's kind of cool. Not good for our party, but that's that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm just going to make a note of this. Okay, so for the next is 1d5, it's just the 6 here. Okay, so it's only, I like guess it's going to be a total of 5 rounds now. i just set the timer over here. All right, so for 5 rounds, 5 rounds, it's this, this sleep effect. From page, what is that, 342? Yeah. 342 sleep effect. And it's a DC. It's going to end up being a DC 14. Uh, we'll save. Yeah, but that means he's going to want to start using weapons instead of spells for that period of time. All right. 
Meanwhile, so well, what is our party doing? Um, let's see, well, we have uh, Phineas is still tied up for another three rounds. All right. Uh, then other party members. Well, I have, I have Igor's character sheet here. I think. Igor would make sense to me that Igor wants to go and actually like untie Phineas. Because I, I, I and like Igor's not in very good shape. And untying somebody is something that can be done relatively easily. Uh, except that he doesn't actually have a knife or anything. So yeah. So that's what he's going to be doing. So Igor is you know going and trying to help untie uh Phineas at this point. I'm going to say that that might help him get untied a little bit faster. So let's actually say yes. When he does that, instead of Phineas being tied for another three rounds, it'll be two more rounds. Okay. Uh, Helmut, then, I think I think Helmut is actually going to be physically attacking uh, the hollow one here. So swinging his club at him. All right. And this is, again, instead of plus zero, uh, nine, it's AC of 12. So that's not going to work. All right. So Helmut misses. Uh, Vilbo also, I think, is going to be attacking. Uh, this is at a minus two. And is a fumble. All right. So, fumble, 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 fumble. Where's my fumble table? There it is. All right. Uh, no, he is not using... He doesn't have any armor or anything, so it's just a d4. Uh, two modified by luck. Uh, luck, he has a plus two, so this would just be, would be a result of zero. Uh, miss wildly, but miraculously cause no other damage. All right, so Vilbo's a swing and a miss. All right. Uh, Marv, then. Remember, Marv is uh, trying to you know sneak around and grab this sapphire. So that is what he is going to be focused on. Uh, so again, this is going to be a... Sneak silently. So is that a plus two? A six again. That's awful. Okay. All right. That didn't work. Uh, next, then. Back around, right, to our hollow one. So now that he has uh, received this blessing from the king of Elfland, uh, he is going to start swinging whatever. Oh, he has a dagger. He's going to tr start trying to use this uh, dagger against... Uh, our characters and try to put them to sleep. So the person who is currently hacking, so, yeah, yeah, let's say that he's going to go after. I'm debating between Marv, who is going for the sapphire, and the two that are fighting him. Uh, in terms of luck, Marv is the least lucky. So I think that is what he's going to do. He's going to turn his attention to the person who's he's clearly like trying to sneak around. Uh, to get to the sapphire. So that's what he's going to do. So he's, he's going to attack him. Um, rolls a 12, and then I modifier doesn't, it would be a plus two, but it doesn't really matter that much uh, because it's his AC is 12, his AC is 11 anyway. Right, so then going to roll a d4 for damage. Came out as a two. Right, so Marv then is down to two. Hit points. Probably it's not in great shape right now. Right. Uh, also, because he got hit by that weapon, uh, he needs to make this will save. So his will is plus zero and it has to be a DC. It's a DC 14. Oh, he got a 13. Okay. Uh, it makes sense for him to go ahead and uh, burn a point of luck. That increases that to a 14, which means then that he is okay. All right. Cool. Uh, next, then, we've got our side. So, Marv is in bad faith. So I think it makes sense one of the clerics is going to try to heal him. Um, of the clerics, I think I don't want to trust Igor at the moment because he just came back from the dead, so he is rolling a pretty nasty penalty. So, yeah, I think we're going to do laying on of hands of Helmet 
So Helmut makes his way over uh, to Marv, lays hands on him, and rolls. This is at a plus one. Ooh, well, oh, that's bad. Okay, so this would. Be... <laughs> okay, so that, that would, this is the first case of disapproval uh, that we have. All right, on a one, so I need to roll a d4, and that tells me where we are on the disapproval table. It's a four. And so the clerk immediately incurs an additional minus one penalty to all spell checks that last until the next day. So currently under a minus one. All right, penalty for the day. And that would also increase the disapproval range up to a four. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not great. All right. That's four people. Um, Marv is injured, but I think he might be at the point where he could try to, to grab the sapphire. He might just grab it, honestly. Um, let's check, is, he, like, is it trapped, which is possible. It feels unlikely. But he's going to see if he can find any traps here. So this is modified by intelligence. Oh, that's not good. That's a minus one. Is that a plus two? Oh, can't roll with anything. He doesn't find any traps. Okay. Goodness. All right. Uh, next, then. All right, so he checks for traps, and that's what's happening that turn. Otherwise, we're fine. Uh, Igor. Igor is also... He's, not great. he's just going to go ahead and try and uh, attack the guy, trying to distract him from Marv. Okay. So, what happens? Nothing. Right, so it's a swing and a miss with his staff. And Vilbo is at a minus two. Right. Also a swing and a miss. That's the worst party ever. All right. So it's a swing and a miss. All right. So that is where we are now. All right. uh, come back around then. Right, to the hollow one and what he's doing. All right. Uh, I, I think it makes sense. He's going to keep going after Marv. He actually kind of got hit it on him before, and he's still going after the Sapphire. Right, so, like, Marv is kind of, like, trying to duck away from this guy. Uh, who's going to continue coming after him? There's no reason not to. This is at a, at a plus two, uh, but that, that it would be a miss. Okay. All right, so that's at least giving us a little bit of a reprieve here. Uh, Marv then is going to grab the sapphire and pick it up. So here's the question. Was there actually a trap there? Oh, it comes out no, but, but what? Maybe it's, maybe this is a weak trap. A very weak one. That, that would make some degree of sense. Right. Right. So yeah, let, let's say that that's what happened. So it's it's a fairly weak trap that gets triggered, um, and it makes sense to me that it would it would hit Marv first. Right, Marv was not expecting this, so does he get a reflex save? No. Instead, he just takes four hit points of damage, which is enough to kill him. So Marv is taken out. But now. The rest of us have a great night. <laughs> okay. It's... All right. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. wait no, not quite yet. Not quite yet. He, he's, not, he's not dead yet because he is a level one character, so we do get a turn to try to heal him before he's, he's bleeding out, but he's not quite out yet. Right, so... It means our clerics can try to do something about this. So let's actually do that. Let's do that then. So, so Marv grabs onto this. Um, the sapphire is immediately slammed right, with some kind of uh, attack. Maybe like a force attack or something like that. Is thrown back, is, is injured. Looks like he very well may be dead or at least is on the edge of death. Right. At which point uh, both Igor and Albert say, oh, well, we can maybe do something about this. I'm going to say Igor moves first, uh, operating here at a... So this roll would be net minus three for length of hands. Um, yeah, yeah, a two is not going to do it, right? So that's not great. 
Um, then Helmut comes over. What would normally be a plus one is now just at a plus zero. So he again, he needs a. They do have. Uh, yes, they do have an alignment of their alignments. Oh, good, 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 good. Okay, so yes. So that, that works. Now, because they are the same alignment, 18 is enough to roll three dice for Marv. Uh, these dice are d6s, I believe. Oh, no. Yes, yes, yes. d6s. So it'd be seven, nine. So, yeah. So, Marv is, in fact, perfectly fine. Comes back five. Now, you do lose a point of stamina from the bleeding out. That's right. But he has some stamina to spare. So, okay. Marv is not as dead as he first appeared. Thank you, Helmut, for saving him. Uh, Vilbo, meanwhile, I think it makes sense for Vilbo just to grab the sapphire and run. So I think that's what he's going to do. And so Vilbo grabs the sapphire and goes to run. Okay. I'm going to then give the Hollow One one last shot at our people. Um, who's he going to be going for? Oh, Phineas is still stuck for another round. But Right, so we have to hang around a little bit just to make sure that he doesn't get killed. Um, but then I think that we're going to dash for it. So, who does the Hollow One going? Who's the Hollow One going to attack in that time? Oh, I mean, Phineas is tied up. The halfling is the one that has the thing. Okay, so it's the halfling. So he is going to attack him with his dagger. Six plus two is eight, which is not quite enough right, to hit Phil, though. All right. So, Vilbo makes it out. Uh, Phineas, the rope vanishes, so Phineas is now untied, uh, which means then all of our party is ready to go, and they're getting out of there as quickly as they possibly can. All right. So, that is that. All right. Um, so, I'm going to call that the session here. Uh, in terms of XP, uh, so we did actually have a character death. Uh, which suggests that 3 XP may be appropriate here. Yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to give everybody 3 experience points for this one. And we also got the Sapphire. So I think this is basically the, the end of the Tower of Thulsa. I think I'm going to do uh, one more session just kind of as, as a wrap-up uh, about that. Uh, as for now, though, this is Profi signing off.